chapter 24. Hey, are we alive? New matter-of-fact cynicisms and stories about the difficulties of life. Quoting Social Democrat Minister Kilman in Ernst Toller's book Hoppla Wir Leben from 1927. Since then, ten years have gone by, where we saw absolutely straight paths, relentless reality came and made them crooked. Nevertheless, things are moving forward. It is a matter of tactics, my dear. Quoting Berthold Brecht's Tagebücher from 1920 to 1922, in me grows a tiny feeling against dichotomies, strong weak, big small, happy unhappy, ideal not ideal. It is so only because people cannot think more than two things. More does not fit into a sparrow's brain, but the healthiest thing is simply manoeuvre. If the revolutionary period had been a time of abrupt contrasts and absolute alternatives in which black and white reigned, ten years later a game of grey and grey nuances, complicated to excess, ruled. By 1928, the people of November 1918 had long since become caught up in the shoving of hard facts and the lesser evil. An all-pervading moral and tactical relativism gnawed away on older images of identity. Literary expressionism had been a final rearing up of the will to simplify. An uprising of modern means of expression against modern experiences, against complexity, relativity, perspectivism. By contrast, the cubist tendency in painting seemed adequate to modernity in that it took account of the experience that things looked different from different perspectives. In the age of tactics, advertising, propaganda, a cubist mentality becomes a general fact of intelligence. With it, from now on, older medals of identity Older models of identity and character seem archaic or folkloric, if not narrow-minded. Under such circumstances it becomes an existential problem how what tradition called the humane cannot be saved from a total emptying and destruction. It is, to use Thomas Mann's words, the quote-unquote suffering and greatness of late bourgeois art that it let itself in for the torment of such questions and the psychopolitical perceptions that force one to them. I want to try and describe some of these perceptions, and with their help to render intelligible the meaning and the painfulness of such questions about the humane and inhumane. In doing so, I initially work with some very bold abstractions that are meant to clarify the modern splitting apart of quote-unquote systems and quote-unquote sensibilities. Weimar social character was formed under the pressure of a threefold front of complexity. The first front imposed itself on the contemporaries as a downright depressing confusion of political structures and power relations. What has been investigated as anti-democratic thinking in the Weimar Republic, Sontheimer and others, is only the tip of the iceberg of social scepticism and private reservations about politics. In it, there was a component of reason that, to the present day, cannot be overlooked. At no time did the transmission of any kind of political will, or mandate, function in the government's policy in a way that would have allowed reliable loyalties to be formed between the voters and the elected. The politicisation of the masses was accompanied from the beginning by a subliminal anti-politics, and was influenced by disappointment, confusion, resentment, and anxious rage, as well as by a profound split between liberal conceptions and a reactionary state apparatus. Between continual foreign political blackmail and extra-parliamentary radicalism, the Republic was put into a state of permanent weakness and a lack of respectability. Large social groups did not want to acknowledge that at any time, quote-unquote, political achievement on the part of the government, in spite of Rathenau and Stresemann and Rapallo and Locarno, 
this unstable, unattractive state of affairs affected a psycho-political polarization between a, let us say, new matter of factness and an old moralist type. Where the former, in part cynically manoeuvring, in part realistically dutiful, tried to come to terms with circumstances in order to make the best of them, the other far more powerful wing rehearsed an uprising of convictions against the facts, the putsch of character against the complications. We have already spoken about fascism as a suggestive political movement of simplification. As such, it participates in a global psychopolitical problematic of modernity. For the pain of modernization pervades the life feelings of all social groups subjected to technical and political adjournment. A particularly German inheritance is also noticeable here. That compulsion to final explanations and to ideological overstatement of even the most banal practical questions. In the friction with American pragmatism there was the streaming in mightily at that time as a new matter of factness. The metaphysical sense of the politicised, educated German citizen was provoked to its ultimate extremes. Today, after decades of planning and sobering up, we can no longer picture the haze of worldviews that overshadowed the political, metaphysical superstructure in the 20s. In it, though for us today it is almost invisible, the actual socio-psychological drama of the Weimar Republic is played out. It unfolds on a subliminal but nevertheless very real front between yes-men and no-men, tacticians and characters cynics and consistent people, pragmatists and idealists. It was perhaps the triumphant secret of the fascists that they succeeded in bursting the psychopolitical front and inventing a cynical idealism, a consistent manoeuvring, a colluding full of character and a nihilistic affirmation. The success of populist nihilism was based not least of all on the seductive trick of enticing the bulk of the refusers, the unhappy, and the no-men, with the prospect that they themselves are the true realists, and summoned co-shapers of a new, grandiose and simplified world. The second front of complications, under whose pressure the ego of the times was deformed, was the nerve-wracking particularism and syncretism of political and ideological groups that screamed at one another in public. This existence has today been buried under a gravestone with the inscription Pluralism. However, at that time, as the masses were still in, or still in no way inclined to grant everything its validity, or rather, to view everything with indifference, quote-unquote pluralism was still something that must have caused pain for the contemporaries. Those who are not completely hardened feel it even today. The contradictions had still a long way to go before they could be felt as mere differences. They were rather felt in their full harshness, and at the same time the levelling tendency began to mix together everything that once stood opposed into a many-sided uniformity. Here, too, the media already took on their typical role of de-dialecticizing reality. See, Excursus 9. With regard to the spiritual state of those times, Musel spoke of a, quote-unquote, Babylonian madhouse, das Huflosser Europa, from whose windows a thousand voices screamed. Weimar pluralism had two poles, an expanding, levelling, global view, and a small-scale, atomistic, retreating pole, while the mass media and the mass parties synchronised consciousness in wide dimensions, innumerable cells buried themselves in detached living spaces, micro-ideologies, sects, subcultural public spheres and regional as well as cultural provinces. Mostly, the contemporaries found out only afterward what kind of times they had really lived in, and what was simultaneous with them. This can be studied well through the style of memoir literature that flourished particularly strongly in this decade. 
the contemporaries of those pluralist realities are simultaneously forced into a role of fringe dwellers who not only live in their local and cultural provinces, but also stand with one foot in the universal. Amphibian mentalities become commonplace. The myths of identity crumble. And the rest is done by the polarisation, clearly felt from the 20s onwards of labour mentality and leisure morality, with which the ego falls apart into separate halves above which quote-unquote character can only try in vain to erect a director ego. Rigi ich. Here it becomes clear for the first time how the switches were shifted for the psychologization of society. A third front is directly adjoining. It is that of the consumerism and cosmetic realism crystallizing of the new middle classes, which are predestined to a new agility and a new frivolousness. For with the ascendancy of the urban civilizations of salaried workers, some particularly like to demonstrate this with the example of Berlin in the 20s, a new socio-psychological era indeed also begins. It bears unmistakable signs of Americanism. Its most significant creation is the leisure time individual, the weekend person who has discovered contentedness and alienation and comfort in a double life. Europe learns the first words in American, among them one that for many symbolises Europe's decline. Weekend. Even the comedian harmonists celebrate its apotheosis. Weekend and sunshine and then alone with you in the woods, I don't need anything else to be happy. Weekend and sunshine, no car, no highway, no body in our vicinity. Deep in the woods, just me and you, dear God, closes an eye. The new themes are gathered. Retreat into leisure time. Modern turning away from the attributes of modernity. Weekend vitalism. And a breath of sexual revolution. How self-evidently it is proposed that the woods can be transformed into relaxation areas for city dwellers. Imagine how only one generation earlier the Germans had still propagated forest mysticism. Sure of their instincts, the hits of the time make use, illusionistically and ironically at the same time, of the leisure time mentality in the new urban middle strata. For them the world should look rosy, and for this, not only dear God closes an eye, the hits belong to a broad system of distraction that profitably and passionately devotes itself to the task of wallpapering the leisure time worlds with comfortable transparent illusions. The ominous twenties introduce the age of mass cosmetics. From it emerges as the main psychological type the smiling distracted schizoid, the quote-unquote nice person in the worst sense of the word. Krakawa who pursued these phenomena at the moment of their emergence, wrote in 1929. A quote from S. Krakauer's Schriften 1, Frankfurt, 1971, page 223. A piece of information that I have obtained from a well-known Berlin department store is extraordinarily instructive. Quote, In employing sales and office personnel, says an influential gentleman in the personnel department, we emphasise above all a pleasant appearance. I ask him what he regards as pleasant, whether spicy or pretty. Not exactly pretty. What is decisive is rather the moral pink skin colour, you know. Gustav Riedler, for, to whom we are indebted for the surreal actors scene in the preceding chapter, also had the opportunity of trying out a close range at close range, a metamorphosis into the nice person in the world of commodities. Married to the daughter of a large department store owner, whom he called The Wolf, the young man was imposed on by his well-meaning father-in-law to take a respectable position in his firm. Regler became an apprentice in textiles and later a supervisor. A quote from Das Ohr 
is Malchus, Frankfurt, 1975, pages 134, 138 to 39, and 140. I learned about customer service, smiling, lying, calculation and measuring up, gentle and energetic behaviour, feigned moods and managers' psychology, salesmen's tricks and trade union demands, government decrees and taxation tricks. I moved further and further from the people to whom I voluntarily had offered myself five years before, and I moved further and further from myself. My nervous system developed what was later called manager's disease. The office became my refuge. It was a flight into activity, the stagnation of the soul. Around public holidays and vacations, there was a dangerous stillness. I was not myself. To manager's disease belongs also that split consciousness that no longer permits one to concentrate on what is essential. A shock had to occur in order to weld the two parts together again. It was in the 20s that the socio-psychological design of the competent, quote-unquote, nice person was carried into the middle-class masses. It created the psychological basis of the new matter of factness, namely that accommodating realism with which the urban cultured strata, hmm, namely that accommodating realism with which the urban cultured strata tried to give a first positive echo to the unalterable and in part welcome facts of modernity. It is not easy to say when the contemporaries consciously registered the change in the psycho, in the socio-psychological climate. What is beyond doubt is that between 1921 and 1925 it must have spread so far that from the middle of the decade onward a conscious, indeed even programmatic restyling of the culture industry and of psychic reflexes could set in with a tendency towards matter of factness. During the hot inflation years of 1921-23, to 23, literature and the quote-unquote history of morals registered a first flickering of crass, neo-hedonistic currents. In the provinces, the concepts Berlin, prostitution and speculation became firmly associated. In the strong economic upturn of the inflationary period, which was accompanied by an intense concentration of capital and an export boom, a new middle-class illusionism celebrated a dress rehearsal while the zeros on the banknotes galloped on. The show began. American reviews made inroads into the German public's expectations. With naked legs and breasts, the new American way of being shameless triumphed. Cries of distress from the Fulda Bishops Conference could do nothing against it. From 1923 on, public entertainment radio also began to cater to the new stage in the socialisation of attentiveness. That a change of climate of grand dimensions had really taken place was felt particularly by those contemporaries who, as prisoners of war, had been cut off for years from the new everyday life of the Weimar Republic. Shocked, they now experienced their return to worlds that had become alien. More strongly than the others, they registered the increasingly impudent demands, the ambivalences and cynicisms of capitalist modernity placed on individuals' will to life and their capacity for affirmation. In Berlin Alexanderplatz, 1929, Dublin narrates just such a story of the return of an individual, Franz Biberkopf. It begins with an impressive description of Biberkopf's journey through the city he has not seen for a long time, during which he becomes giddy. The novel carries on medico-cynical and military-cynical lines from the war. In the big city too the struggle goes on. Bilberkopf becomes a one-armed man. The city befalls him like a shattered front on anyone who wants to have quote-unquote character and to be a quote-unquote upright person. Uh, anyone who wants to have character and be an upright person has to lose himself. With Biberkopf, the failure of self-preservation and wanting to be strong is gruesomely exercised. 
In the end, as he lies dying in a madhouse, his death reveals to him what he has done wrong. Quoting from pages 388 to 91. You have cramped yourself into strength, and the cramp has still not evaporated, and it's no use. You just want to be strong. Just blabbed, poor me, poor me, and how unjust that I suffer, and how noble I am, and how refined, and they don't let me show what I'm really like. Max Hultz, the most well-known political terrorist of the 20s, who after eight years imprisonment in German penitentiaries was granted amnesty in 1928, mentions in his narration, still worth reading today, of his experiences of youth, struggle and prison. Vom Wiesen Kreuz zur Roten Fahne From the White Cross to the Red Flag, Berlin 1929. The indescribable impression, the images of new big city streets, the cars, display windows and people made on him on his return. The most significant story of return has been related by Ernst Toller. After five years imprisonment in a notorious Bavarian fortress penitentiary, Niederschönenfeld am Lech, 1919-24, he himself experienced a return of this kind into a new, matter-of-factly changed Weimar society. When he was released in June 1924, the Republic was approaching, for the first time since its founding, an apparent stabilisation. In these years of the quote-unquote compulsion of things, of compromises and new realism, Toller continued his political moral process of disillusionment. He inhaled thoroughly the cynical spirit of the times, studied and portrayed it with all possible means. The results of his observations is Hopla wir leben. Hey, we're alive. One of the most impressive plays of his decade, imbued with the experience of the times and stamped by the growing pains of a bitter but clear-sighted realism. Erwin Piscator staged this play at great expense in Berlin in 1927. Quote, you have to learn to see, and in spite of it not let yourself be pushed down, end quote, says Kroll, a worker in the second act of the play. He who has to learn to see is the revolutionary of 1918, Carl Thomas, the returnee. He has been locked up in a madhouse for eight years. With the old ideas in his head, he now collides with the new reality of 1927. He cannot comprehend what had happened in the meantime in the minds of the leaders, the honest and the fellow fighters of that time. For him, two developments are confounded to a horrifying snarl that overstrains his powers of understanding. On the one hand, the confrontation of the old utopian radical left with the painful facts of the Republic's daily life. On the other, the reorientation of a mass urban climate towards consumerist, illusionist, cosmetic and distracted forms of life. Released from the madhouse, it seems to him, more than ever that he has landed in the loony bin. Nevertheless, he quickly understands that the smiling face belongs to the new style, completely in the sense of the quote-unquote moral pink skin colour so dear to the personnel boss. Thus, he puts himself in the hands of a cosmetologist. A quote here. Don't be scared, Mother Mella. You don't have to be afraid that I will go crazy again. Everywhere I looked for work, the bosses asked me, Man, what kind of deathly bitter mean do you have? You'll scare away the customers. Nowadays, one must smile. Always smile. So, then I went to a beauty specialist. And here is the new facade. Couldn't you just eat me up? Well, yes, Carl, you will impress the girls. At first it was weird for me, all the things they demand. Next you'll have to undertake, undertake by contract to smile for ten hours while you're working. Reader's note. That last line is in italics. To smile for ten hours while you're working. Through this part of the snarl, Carl finds his way more or less with fatalistic accommodation and irony. But things go differently for him with the political moral changes, about which Ava Berg, his firm, former lover, says, 
The last eight years have changed us more than otherwise a century would have done. In a more mature, tactical and mournful socialism, the old moral insurrectionary language fails. Karl Thomas calls the new matter-of-factness of the committed left hardening. Is it? Ava, who understands herself to be thoroughly within the tradition of the socialist struggle, speaks of growing up. Once again you use concepts that no longer hold. We can no longer afford to be children. We can no longer throw clear-sightedness, knowledge that has grown in us, into the corner. The new experience had consumed the old political moralism just as much as the new sexual relations had overcome the old expectations of fidelity, possessive relationships and commitment. Karl Thomas also suffers because sleeping with this woman guarantees no hope of a future with her. In his mind, the various aspects of modernization become blurred. Glittering transitional zones form between emancipation and decadence, progress and corruption, sobriety and nihilism. Under the burden of these numerous ambivalences, Thomas finally breaks down. Confused and despairing, he decides to jump off this carousel of crazy matter-of-factness. He wants to undertake one more deed as a finale, and plans the assassination of Kilman, the social democrat minister who had tried in vain to explain to him that social democratic cynicism is down to earth, and that progress prefers crooked paths. Thomas then hangs himself in the cell in which he had been locked in place in the, of the real murderer who naturally came from the right. In heavy scenes, Toller outlines the panorama of a methodically inverted world. Cynically direct, the paradoxes pile up. Count Lander, who financed the murder, unveils the monument for the murdered man. Kilman's daughter, who confesses to lesbian tendencies, also goes to bed with this Count Lander, and so on. If one asks for the tendency of this play, it is certainly to be found in a call to socialism to hold up the flame of utopia, even in the middle of tactical sobriety, instead of turning into cynicism. The struggle must not turn the fighter for the good goal into a beast. The socialist flame, Ava says, is not extinguished, but glows in another way, less pathetically. However, because this flame is no longer in a position to shed any clear light on social relations, its rays are soaked up by the general twilight. Those who still want to orient themselves with it must represent socialism with the stance of a leftist existentialism, with a pinch of sociology, or they, as heroes, will be broken by despair. Toller shows both endings of the drama beside each other, with one half of his heart bound to those who are perishing, the other learning further, hoping further. Even the last of the quote-unquote perspectivistic worldviews is overcome by an irrevocable emergence of the quote-unquote a-perspectivist world, in Gibbs's terms. The latter demands from us an unencumbered, many-sided and continually new viewpoint. Hopla Verleben is a significant document for quote-unquote political cubism in the non-dogmatic Weimar intelligentsia. It shows the observer that those who value an intelligent relationship with their times can never return to the simplicity of the relation between a naive ego and a clearly structured mono-perspectivist world. The universe becomes a multiverse, and the individual becomes a multi-individual, a multiply divided being. <clears throat> Excursus 9. Media Cynicism and Training in Arbitrariness. Quoting Josef Roth. Die Flucht ohne Ende, 1927. Yes, said Tonda, one loses one's distance. One is so close to things that they don't have anything to do with one anymore. Quoting Vicky Baum, Mention im Hotel, 1931. 
His head was a hot ball into which too many things had been thrown, and now they were beginning to hiss and melt. Modern mass media cater to a new kind of artificial acclimatization of consciousnesses in social space. Those who are drawn into its currents experience how their world picture becomes more and more exclusively mediated, sold, acquired second hand. News floods televised consciousness with world material and information particles. At the same time, the media dissolve the world into fluorescing news landscapes that flicker on the consciousness screen of the ego. The media really do possess the power to ontologically reorganise reality as reality in our heads. It is part of all this that everything must begin quite innocently. People read the newspaper, believe that they are absorbing things that interest them, listen to the radio from the 20s on, hurry along overpopulated streets full of advertising and display windows with enticing offers. They inhabit cities that are nothing other than constructed mass media, covered by transportation and sign networks that direct the streams of people. The metropolis appears as a gigantic, instantaneous water heater that pumps the subject of plasma through its tube and sign systems. See Rathenau's metaphors in chapter 18. Conversely, the egos too function as instantaneous heaters, filters and channels for the streams of news that reach our sensory organs in the most diverse domains of broadcasts. The ego and the world thus get caught in a double state of liquefaction, in that ontological tossing that precipitates in a thousand and one modern crisis theories. That with qualities and character one no longer gets very far in such a state of the world is shown by the numerous stories about character and morals that not infrequently end with the hero's downfall. Conformity becomes the psychopolitical requirement of the times. Where could it be better practiced than in dealing with the urban media? They provide consciousness with its daily quota of grey variety, colourful uniformity, and normal absurd absurdity that repeatedly drums anew into the head of the ego that has regressed into moralism that it should practice Brechtian manoeuvring. We provide examples from contemporary literature of how intelligent individuals cope with the impertinence of the media world. Eric Kessner's outstanding novel of the time, Fabian, begins unavoidably with such a snapshot. Quoting from page 7 of that book. Fabian sat in a cafe called Split Wood and read the headlines of the evening papers. English airship explodes over Bouvet. Strychnine stored next to lentils. Nine-year-old girl jumps out of window. Another unsuccessful prime ministerial election. The murder in the Lance Zoo. Scandal in the town requisitions office. The artificial artificial voice in the vest pocket. Ruhr, Ruhr, coal sales decline. Gifts for Neumann, the director of the Federal Railways. Elephants running loose on the streets. Nervousness on the coffee markets. Scandal around Clara Bow. Impending strike on 140,000 metal workers. Dramatic crime in Chicago. Negotiations in Moscow about timber dumping. Starenberg Hunters Revolt. The Daily Quota. Nothing special. In the linear sequencing of great, small, important, unimportant, crazy, serious and so on, what is quote-unquote special and quote-unquote actual reality disappears. Those who have to live continually in this false sameness of values lose their capacity to recognise in the eternally gloomy light things in their individuality and essentialness. Through every particular, one sees only the basic tone, the grey, care, absurdity. A scene comparable to the one quoted can be found in the very beginning of Ermgard Coyne's con contemporaneous novel, Gilgi, Eine von Uns. Gilgi, one of us, 1931. The returned soldiers in particular see through this media world very clearly. One of them is Lieutenant Tunda, 
the main character in Josef Roth's important novel Die Flucht ohne Ende, 1927. He too sees with the eyes of someone coming from outside. He returns from the fighting of the Russian Revolution in Siberia to Western Europe to find a world in which a homecoming is no longer possible. What he brings with him is the power of estrangement. Quoting page 94 of that text, He saw the improbable events and facts, because the usual events and facts too seemed remarkable to him. He possessed the uncanny ability to understand the uncannily rational madness of the city. Of course, here Berlin is being described once again as the European Chicago, quoting Mark Twain. Here a quote from pages 95 and 96. Within a few days we saw someone running amok and a procession, a film premiere, a film shoot, the death jump of a performer on Unter den Linden, someone mugged, the asylum for the homeless, a love scene in the zoo in broad daylight, rolling advertising pillars drawn by donkeys, 13 pubs for homosexual and lesbian couples, a man who had to pay a fine because he jaywalked across a square instead of walking at right angles, a meeting of the Onion Eaters sect and the Salvation Army. It was the time when the literati, the actors, the film directors, the painters earned money again. It was the time after the stabilisation of the German currency in which new bank accounts had been opened. Even the most radical periodicals had well-paid advertisements, and the radical writers earned honoraria in the literary supplements on the bourgeois newspapers. The world was already so consolidated that the feuilletons had allowed to be revo uh, were allowed to be revolutionary. The world was already so consolidated that the feuilletons were allowed to be revolutionary. Besides this, Toller's model returnee, Carl Thomas, discovers as a waiter in the Grand Hotel the new radio reality. He listens for the first time to the cynical synchronising of all events and texts in the news ether. Uh, here is a dialogue. Reader's note, I will use two different voices for the dialogue rather than announcing who the speakers are except for the first line. Carl Thomas. Does one really hear the whole world here? Telegraphist. Is that something new for you? Or whom are you listening to now? New York. Widespread flooding on the Mississippi reported. When? Now, in the last hour. While we're speaking. Yes, while we're speaking. The Mississippi is bursting its levees. People are fleeing. I'll switch over. Latest news from all the world. Loudspeaker. Attention, attention. Unrest in India. Unrest in China. Unrest in Africa. Paris, Paris, Hubergant. The sophisticated perfume. Bucharest. Bucharest food shortage in Romania. Berlin. Berlin. The elegant woman prefers green wigs. New York, New York. The largest bomber in the world invented. Able to reduce Europe's capitals to rubble in one second. Attention, attention. Paris, London, Rome, Berlin, Calcutta, Tokyo, New York. The Cavalier drinks mum extra dry. That this new media ontological situation deals the death blow to classical metaphysics has been formulated by no one as clearly as Robert Musil. The 54th chapter in Der Mann ohne Eigenschaften, The Man Without Qualities, 1930, presents an attempt, on the highest level of irony, to play out the new, decentered, virtually subjectless media ontology against the old, holistic ontology. In doing so, the conventional concept of the bourgeois individual, who wanted to be whole and indivisible, dissolves. The climax of the dialogue between Walter and Ulrich is as follows. Quoting page 217 of that text. One has to treasure it if today a man still strives to be something whole, said Walter. Now, that doesn't exist anymore, Ulrich pronounced. You only have to look into a newspaper. It is filled with an immeasurable opacity. There, 
So many things are spoken about that it would exceed the thinking capacity of a Leibniz. But one doesn't even notice it. We have changed. No longer does a whole person confront a whole world, but a human something moves around in a universal nutritional fluid. Excursus 10. People in a hotel. Quoting Walter Meiring in Hopla via Leben. In this hotel on earth, the cream of society was guessed. It bore with an effortless composure the heavy burden of life. At a time when the people's horizon was admittedly extended into the cosmopolitan realm without letting them really share in the good of happiness of the big world, the hotel had to become a mythical place. It symbolised a dream of social heights on which the modern ephemerality of existence could at least be compensated for with worldly, comfortable glamour. In the hotel, the world chaos seemed to organise itself once more into a scintillating cosmos, like a last organic form. It resisted the confounding and arbitrariness of events. This elevated the hotel to a central aesthetic idea of modernity. As if of itself, it suits the review-like, polythematic, simultaneous forms of experience in the big city, and nevertheless as a factor of unity, possesses its own myth, the genius loci and its inner order. In these hotels of the world theatre, exotic and typical characters of the times, driftwood and wave caps of society hurry about every one of them bizarre and nostalgically individual, and every one of them also representative and fluorescing in the multivalent milieu. Each represents a species as if the hotel were a Noah's Ark of the last individualities. The authors are given the opportunity of presenting the great menagerie of character types one more time. Reception managers, false barons, ageing female dancers from Russia, one-armed elevator operators, homosexual English lords, manufacturers' wives with curious predilections, financiers who transact business around the world from the desk telephone, histrionically talented sons of champagne factory owners, pensioned officials and moribund people who look on at the glitter world with downturned mouths and feverish eyes, knowing that things are coming to an end and that not all that glitters is gold. Just such an interestingly nauseous character as Dr. Otternschlag in Vicky Baum's successful novel Mention im Hotel, People in a Hotel, 1931. A person destroyed by life who believes he knows that quote-unquote real life for us always lies in the future, the past or somewhere else, can never be grasped, and finally through all the waiting has already flown by. His eyes do not allow themselves to be deceived by the spell of the Grand Hotel, especially in a slow hour for business, when the whole world pursues its vices and business interests. Quoting pages 11 and 12. Things stood about him like dummies. Whatever he took to hand crumbled onto dust. The world was a brittle affair, not to be grasped, not to be held onto. One fell from emptiness to emptiness. One carried a sack full of darkness around within oneself. This Dr. Ottenschlag lives in the deepest of loneliness, although the world is full of his kind. In the newspapers he found nothing that satiated him. A typhoon, an earthquake, a moderately large war between black and white, arson, murders, political struggles. Nothing. Too little. Scandals? Panic on the stock exchange? Losses of enormous fortunes? What did it have to do with him? What did he feel of it? Transoceanic flight? Speed records? Inch-high sensational headings? One paper cried louder than the other, and in the end one did not listen to any of them, became blind and dumb and numb due to the loud activity of the century. Pictures of naked women? Thighs, breasts, hands, teeth, 
They offered themselves in pretty piles. Ottenschlag is the professional, melancholy hotel cynic, a dejected realist who provides knowledge of decay. Quoting page 36. When you leave, someone else comes and lies in your bed. <laughs> That's that. Why don't you sit yourself down for a couple of hours in the foyer and observe closely? The people don't have faces. They are only dummies, every one of them. They're all dead and don't even know. Grand Hotel. Bella Vita, eh? Oh well. The main thing is that one must have one's suitcase packed. <laughs>